welcome. Thank you all for coming uh, to this Federalist Society event. I think this really is like the core of what we'd like to do at the Iowa chapter, lawyers chapter of the Federalist Society, which is to take a topic that is of interest to lawyers, especially public policy, legal, and bring in two, two or more great speakers who have opposite viewpoints and let them air those ideas. And to get them past the talking points, to go an hour or whatever it takes uh, to get the ideas out, and then to take really good, interesting questions from the audience. So we have a really great panel of speakers today on the issue of judicial selection, which is obviously a topic up at the legislature right now. So first, uh, to my right, is Tom Levis. He is a partner at the Brick Gentry Law Firm in mainly civil litigation. He's also president of the Iowa Bar Association and also a member of the 5C Judicial Nominating Commission. Uh, oh, I, I, I thought we were good. <laughs> <laughs> This is not, <laughs> applause, applause whenever, I don't know, this is not a debate, you can, you can you applause whenever, not, 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 a, not a political debate, so. To his right is Brian Fitzpatrick, a professor at Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, he went to Harvard, was a law clerk to Justice Scalia, and also worked uh, in the Senate on, comp on the confirmation process and practiced for a while at Sidley Austin uh, in D.C. So. I will let them get started. We're, the format will be Brian will talk for a while, Tom will talk for a while, they'll do it again, and then I will carry the microphone through the crowd so that you can ask your questions. So with that, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. You can applaud me as often as, as you wish. Uh, no, but uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. I was worried with the weather. We wouldn't have many people here tonight, but it just goes to show that you are much hardier than people in Tennessee are. And so I, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate Tom being here, lending his time to the Federalist Society to discuss these important issues uh, tonight. I do want to start by saying that I come here in peace. It is not my job or mission to remake your judiciary in the image of my old boss, Justice Scalia. I personally am a supporter of gay marriage, so I'm not here because I'm mad at your Supreme Court for creating a right to gay marriage. I personally am very pro-plaintiff. I have a book coming out in October called The Conservative Case for Class Action Lawsuits. So I'm not here because I think your court is too pro-plaintiff. I'm here because I think that there's a legitimate question to be asked about why lawyers get more say on one-third of the government of Iowa than the rest of the people of Iowa. I think that is a legitimate question to ask irrespective of how the Iowa Supreme Court has or has not decided your favorite cases. The other thing I want to say at the outset is I understand, I don't want to prejudge what Tom has to say, but I understand why the bar likes the current system. Uh, the current system gives lawyers a lot of power. Almost half of the commission that decides who the governor can put on your courts is selected by the legal profession and no one else. That is a lot of power over one full branch of government. People like power. You don't have to be greedy. You're just a regular person. If someone gives you a lot of power and then they say they're going to take it away, I understand why you would not like that. So I don't begrudge the legal profession for wanting to keep the power that they have under the current system. I'm just asking here tonight can that power be defended intellectually? And I don't think it can. The three things that I hear from proponents of giving lawyers outsized influence over judicial selection are these, th these three things. Number one, lawyers know better than the rest of us about what makes a good judge. Therefore, giving lawyers more power will produce better judges. That's one thing I hear a lot. I don't think that's true, and I'm going to explain why in a moment. Number two, 
I often hear that if we use these commissions with lots of lawyers, we will end up with judges that reflect racial and gender diversity better than if we rely on other systems. I don't think that's true either, and I'll tell you why in a moment. And then lastly, people who support these commissions that are dominated by lawyers, they say, we need to keep the lawyers dominating the commissions because lawyers are apolitical. If we have other people, say the governor or legislators, choosing the members of these commissions, it will become political and that'll be bad. I don't think that's true either. So I'm going to go through each of those three things. Number one, do lawyer commissions pick better judges than other people who pick judges do? Uh, the answer to this is no. Political scientists and law professors have been studying this very question for 50 years. There is now probably one dozen different empirical studies that attempt to assess whether the quality of judges in one selection system is better than the quality of judges in a different selection system. Now, all of these studies have to look at proxies for quality because it's very hard to define what is a good judge. But here are the proxies that we have looked at. Number one, how many years of experience does the lawyer have when they become a judge? Does the person picked for this judicial appointment have any prior judicial experience? How good is the law school that the person went to? How productive is the person once they get on the bench? Do they write a lot of opinions or do they not write very many opinions? And my favorite one, how often are their opinions cited by judges in other states? Judges that don't have to cite their opinions, but because they said something so thoughtful that the judges wanted to cite their opinions. We have looked at all these proxies for quality over and over and over again. And the answer that comes back is there is no difference between merit commission selected judges and judges that are politically appointed and judges that are elected by the population. We can find no statistical significant difference between any of these systems. So I'm sorry to say to the lawyers, and I must tell you, this surprises me. As a lawyer, I assumed that I would pick better judges than other people would pick, but the data does not bear this out. And I think one re reason why the data does not bear this out is because no matter what system you use, lawyers are going to be involved in the vetting of judicial nominees. The question you have to ask yourself here in Iowa is do you want to give lawyers a veto over who the judicial nominees are? But lawyers will always be involved. When the President of the United States picks his judicial nominees, he has a whole team of lawyers vetting them. When the United States Senators decide whether to vote to confirm those people, they have a whole team of lawyers helping them. The American Bar Association does a report on every single person the president nominates, investigating their background, interviewing their clients, interviewing their opposing counsel, and they rate these people. So lawyers are involved every time we select someone. The question is, how involved should they be? Should they give us their opinion, or should we give them a veto power? But on the first claim by proponents, I don't think there's any evidence that putting a bunch of lawyers on these commissions produces better judges. Second, what about diversity? This issue, too, has been studied by empiricists for many decades. And there is no evidence that merit commissions produce more or less racial diversity or gender diversity than the other systems. There are some studies that have suggested yes. There are some studies that have suggested no. There's no consistent answer that one system is better than another. So if the reason you want your merit commission here to keep all these lawyers on it is because you think we're going to have more women on the Iowa Supreme Court or more racial minorities on the Iowa Supreme Court, I just don't think there's any reason in the data to be confident that that is, in fact, what is going to happen uh, by keeping lawyers on these commissions. Let me turn to the third reason proponents give, and that is lawyers are not political. I really uh, find this an amusing 
uh, claim uh, because um, I, I guess it's because I know so many lawyers. <laughs> and and uh, the lawyers that I know are not apolitical. Uh, when uh, Herbert Kritzer, who's a very famous political scientist at the University of Wisconsin, when he looked into merit systems and he interviewed the various players in these systems over many years, he came to the following conclusion. The lawyers on these commissions are not apolitical, he said. They are just differently political. Of course the lawyers have political views. Of course, lawyers want their political views written into the law. Of course, lawyers are going to care about whether the judges they pick are going to embrace their views once they get on the bench. Lawyers are just like the rest of us in all of those ways. They are not superhuman. They, of course, are curious about how the judges they might pick might decide important cases. But lawyers are differently political, as Professor Kritzer said. What does that mean? Well, lawyers have political views, but they have very different political views than the rest of the public. There's a wonderful new study out by a political scientist from Harvard and a political scientist from Stanford, Adam, Bonica, and Maya Sin. They took the Martindale Hubble database directory of lawyers in the United States and they mashed it up against a directory a database of campaign contributions that people made in 2012 they mashed the two things up matched all the names and they showed the political leanings of lawyers in the United States of America they've done it for every state they've done it for every law school you can go look up your state and your law school in their paper but if you look at the political leanings of lawyers they are far to the left of the general public. Lawyers are more liberal than the rest of us. So when you put lawyers in a place of privilege to select important public officials, you may very well end up with public officials that are much to the left of the public as well. Lawyers, again, cannot help but want to see their own views reflected in our society and in our laws. We don't really have to speculate about this. I have spent several years doing a study that looks at the political leanings of appellate judges in every state in the United States. Between 1990 and 2010, 3,000 people served as appellate judges in the United States in state courts during those years. I looked up the campaign contributions of every one of those appellate judges, and I compared what were the political leanings of the appellate judges in each state? I compared it to the political leanings of the people in each state. Were the judges reflective of the people's views or were the judges to the left or to the right of the people's views? And what I found was in states like yours that use merit commissions with spots reserved for uh, lawyer selected commissioners, the judges are much to the left of the people who live in their states. And I have to tell you, I, I, I'm sorry to tell you, Iowa was the second worst offender of any of the 50 states in this country. Your judges are further out of step to the left from your public than all but one state in the United States of America, at least between 1990 and 2010. And, I, you know, I am not an expert in... You're the jurisprudence of your courts here, but since I've been here, I've heard a lot of people tell me about various decisions of the Iowa Supreme Court that they think is consistent with what I have said, a court that is far to the left of the public here. Now, I want to go back to something I said at the beginning. I am not here to cast judgment on whether it is good or bad to be a liberal court or a conservative court. I'm simply asking why should the court be so far out of step with the public? And why should lawyers get their political views reflected on the court instead of everyone else's? If they're not picking better judges, if they're not picking more diverse judges, why do their political views get special prominence on your courts instead of everyone else's? I don't have a good answer to that question, but I hope 
Tom does. Thank you very much. I don't know if I'll have better answers or not, but thank you all for coming today. Good afternoon. I am Tom Levis. I'm the president of the Iowa Bar Association. And I, I'd like to clean up a misperception that, that a lot of Iowans have and perhaps legislators have. The Iowa Bar Association is a trade organization. It is, has nothing to do with nominating commissions, how they are selected. They have nothing to do with the control of nominating commissions. The Bar Association represents the 7,500 or so lawyers in the state and, and, uh, but is not involved in nominating commissions. Now, having said that, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my background and there's kind of a reason for me doing this and you'll find out, but, but I grew up in Little Sheraton, Iowa, which is a little town south of Des Moines, about 50 miles, where my father was best friends with a, with a pretty famous judge in Iowa, William Stewart. Those of you that remember Judge Stewart, uh, Bill Stewart was uh, uh, on the Iowa Supreme Court and he was later a federal district court judge and he was also a Republican leader in the House of Representatives uh, back in the 50s when the merit selection system was first proposed and adopted. Um, I have been a lawyer for 41 and a half years. Uh, during my career I've done criminal defense I've represented people in big cases and little cases. I've done jury trials. I have done bench trials. I have represented people in counties all over the state. I've practiced in front of both federal courts, the Southern District and the Northern District of Iowa. Uh, there was a significant time in my career when I was at the courthouse every day. Uh, and I mean five days a week. Uh, Mr. Olson back here was, was right there with me on a lot of, a lot of the times. Uh, <clears throat> uh, after practicing for 41 and a half years and being in front of judges so much, I thought I might have kind of a good idea of what a good judge might look like. So I applied to be a member of the, what we call the Polk County Judicial Nomination Commission, or it's also known as the 5C Commission. And several of, of my commissioner pals are here in the room with us today. But uh, I was elected uh, in 2014 uh, to the 5C Commission, which is by far the busiest commission of all the commissions in Iowa. Uh, for those of you, and I suspect most of the people are lawyers here, but, but uh, we have 15 commissions in Iowa. There is the State Judicial Nominating Commission, which takes care of Supreme Court Justices and Court of Appeals. Then we have 14 District Court uh, Nominating Commissions around, around the state. 5C, or the Polk County one, is the one here in Des Moines, and it takes care of the judges in Des Moines. Uh, I got elected to be on that commission by my peers, by the lawyers in Des Moines, by the lawyers here in Polk County. Uh, I believe they elected me as a commissioner because they thought I'd been around, I'd experienced a lot of experiences at the courthouse, and that I might be a good person to participate in the selection of our judges. When I was a elected to be on the commission in 5C, I thought I might have the opportunity to pick one or two judges over the next six years. You serve for six years. Uh, in the last five years, we've been involved with 10, 10, uh, 10 judges. We've had a big turnover, uh, which has been an absolutely fascinating experience. Uh, just so that you all know, the current lawyer members of the commission in Polk County, 5C, are Jake Firehelm. He's a longtime criminal defense lawyer who's probably been practicing for, I don't know, at least 40 years. Uh, Fred James, who's a longtime civil plaintiff's lawyer. Brooke Timmer, who's an employment lawyer. Uh, uh, and a woman named Angie Schutz, who is primarily a divorce lawyer. The governor appointed members, some of them are here today. Uh, Nicole Crane, I think, I don't know if Nicole's in here with us or not, but Nicole is with, uh, she's a vice president here at uh, ABI. Uh, Steve Bowl, I, I did see Steve, he's around here somewhere. He's a businessman from Ankeny and he's the husband of Carmen Bowl, who many of you know, I think is the clerk of the Senate. Uh, Marvis Landon, she's the wife of, uh, of John Landon, a representative from Ankeny. And then Tom Bernal, who is a uh, banker and a businessman uh, from Des Moines. When a judge retires, the commissioners are notified. We have a little organizational meeting. We set a deadline for when candidates apply. 
and we set a deadline as to when they're going to get interviewed by the commission as a whole. Over that pr approximately 30 plus days, we get applications from everybody that wants to be a judge in Polk County. Uh, the applications are extensive. I see a lot of judges in here. They had to fill them out. They're awful. They're very, they're very thorough. Uh, they're very extensive. Um, and I'm sure they're a pain in the rear to complete. Uh, but we need them. Uh, th they also uh, go into all sorts of background information about what kind of practices they've had and the like. We get uh, background checks on them, criminal background checks. We see all that data. And we get letters of recommendations. We get calls from lawyers and non-lawyers all, all over the county uh, making recommendations on this person or that. I, I said 10 people that I've been involved in, 10 judges I've been involved in. The first one, I thought it would be important for me to print everything off. You know, I'm still kind of old school. So I was going to print off all the applications, everything else, so I'd have them in a book. The stack of materials that I got for that first time was over a foot and a half tall of the materials that were provided to us. Each one of the commissioners got that. Each one of them had to read it, and I know they all did. I know in the appointed members and the lawyer-elected members did. Uh, in addition, we talked to lots of people about uh, the candidates. Uh, in terms of talking directly with candidates, uh, I can tell you that I was, I was always been contacted by candidates ahead of time before the position was even posted. So I would go to Panera's or their office or my office or someplace and we would sit down and chat for an hour or two and talk about why they want to be a judge, why they think it, they'd be a good judge and separate themselves from maybe other candidates. Uh, I think most of the commissioners do that. Uh, I'm uh, pretty certain that all of the lawyer commissioners do that. Uh, we get like writing samples from all the commissioners, uh, extensive writing samples. Uh, sometimes they're 100 pages, 150 pages long. But we read them. We do read them. Um, anyway, uh, we, at the, after we've got all the applications in, uh, we have the interviews in a conference room at the courthouse, and all the commissioners, all 11 of us, sit around the table, the five appointed members and the five lawyer members and the judge, which in, uh, in the past has been Judge Gamble, but since he retired, it's going to be Judge Rosenberg in the future. We sit around the table, and then the candidates come in one by one. They talk to us for... 20, 30 minutes and tell us about why they should be a judge. We get to ask them lots of questions and all the commissioners do. We all ask questions. Uh, but one of the things we don't do, we don't ask political questions. We don't ask them what party they're, we don't care. We're not involved in that. Um, no one asks them how they'd vote on a case. No one, no one, no one talks to them about uh, whether they would reverse a decision by somebody or not. Uh, we don't ask political things because it's not a political situation. We're looking to try to select the best candidates that we can send to the governor's office. Uh, after we've uh, interviewed all the candidates, then we sit around and for about an hour, uh, we talk about the candidates, the pros and the cons, why Tom likes this one and is not so high on this one. And we do that all the way, Nicole likes this one or whatever. We talk about it and uh, we do all the pros and cons about it. and and exhaust that. Once we're done with that, then it's time to vote, and it's a secret ballot, so we don't know, and, and, the, uh, and I don't know who all votes for whom, but I can tell you that the, the, the voting process generally takes very short time, literally minutes, because the cream kind of rises to the top. You all kind of know. The lawyer members and the appointed members kind of know who the best candidates are. There's always four, maybe five, out of sometimes 20, 25, there's kind of four or five that are just kind of there, and that's what happens. And we, so the voting it usually doesn't take very long. If somebody gets six votes, that's more than half, they're nominee number one. Then we vote all again with the rest of the candidates. When somebody gets six, that's nominee number two, and the chief judge then sends those two names to the governor's office, uh, who gets to select one of the two. The, uh, uh, Relationship among our, the commissioners, I, the, several of them are in here. I, uh, you know, after you've done this 10 times and you've been in these commission meetings and we've had organizational meetings and we talk on the telephone too, uh, I, I think we're, we have a very good relationship among ourselves. Uh, I didn't know any of them before I went on the commission. I didn't know any of the, the, the appointed members until I went on the commission, but I can tell you that I've become pretty good friends with them. and. Uh, uh, and, I, and I appreciate the, the, what, the, what the qualities that they bring to the, to the commission. 
Um, now, I, I tell you about this background because um, I, I think it sets me apart from Professor Fitzpatrick. <laughs> uh, he's not practiced in Iowa. He doesn't know our judges. He doesn't know our judicial nomination process, what we're doing in our, in our commission meetings. Uh, he's never practiced in Des Moines. Uh, he's never served on any nominating commissions. And so, let's, and you heard him talk about some studies and the like, but let's talk about the real data. I think we should talk about the real data. Let me tell you about the data. And we got this data from the state of Iowa, all right, from the state of Iowa. On the State Judicial Nomination Commission, the one that appoints, that selects the candidates for the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals, eight, the eight appointed members are all Republicans. Of the elected members, five are Democrats, two are Republicans, and there's one independent. There are 17 members on the state nominating commission, 10 Republicans, five Democrats, and one other. If the Republicans all vote together, there's no way any left-leaning candidate could get appointed to the Iowa Supreme Court or the Iowa Court of Appeals. It can't happen. District Court Commissions. There are 14 of them around the state, including 5C, the one that I'm involved in. Of the 14, 12 of them are controlled by Republican commissioners. They're controlled by Republican commissioners. The two that are not are District 5C, which is one I'm in, which is Polk, and the other one is the Iowa City, it's District 6, it's Iowa City and uh, Cedar Rapids. Uh, and in both 5C and in District 6, the commissioners are split 50-50. Half of them are Republicans and half of them are Democrats. But in total, in the total of all the commissioners in all the commissions across the state, right now 67% of them are Republicans. Two-thirds of them are Republicans. There's nothing theoretical about those numbers. That's the data we got from the state. We thought what, we, what would be interesting would be in each judicial district, how the Democrat-Republican uh, makeup compared with the population base in those particular districts, how the, if, you know, how many, what's the proportion of Republicans on these commissions to the number, the proportion of Republicans in that particular district. In 5C, uh, the number of Republicans on the 5C commission, they're 22 percent higher than the Republicans generally in Polk County. In 2A, which is Franklin County and Cerro Gordo, north of Des Moines, uh, all the commissioners are Republicans. Uh, it's, it's 41 percent higher for the Republicans in that district uh, than what the population base is. I can do that with every judicial nomination district everyone, every judicial nomination commission in the state, the Republicans control each and every one of them. The data is also in the pudding. Uh, the last three justices uh, appointed by the Supreme, appointed to the Supreme Court, Justice Mansfield and Waterman and Justice Christensen, are all, I think without question, uh, conservative Republicans. Uh, I know that there's been lots of talk in the legislature and around the state that that these left-leaning lawyers are running the State Judicial Nomination Commission. Well, if they are, they haven't done a very good job. <laughs> Professor Fitzpatrick claims that he's examined data for Iowa justices from 1990 to 2010, that he looked at their political contributions uh, to determine their, you know, whether they're left-leaning or right-leaning or what. Uh, it's the, the only problem I have with that data is it's illegal in Iowa it's against the canons of ethics for judges to make political contributions. So I don't know what, where he got his data. Um, but I know that the data that I'm giving you tonight is accurate and it's real data and it's some, it's came from the state. Uh, in addition, I think Professor Fitzpatrick will talk about the number of justices in, there were, you know, from 19, 1990 to 2010, there were 15 Supreme Court justices, 15 of them. Uh, during that period of time, 10 of them were appointed by Republican governors, Governor Ray and Governor Branstad, 10 of them, 10 of the 15. The five were appointed by Governors Vilsack and Culver. Again, the Republicans controlled the show. Let me talk to you about business. 
the Chamber of Commerce publishes a state-by-state -state survey of state courts. They rank each state by fairness and reasonableness. Some of you may have seen this, but uh, Iowa, for instance, ranks currently number 13. Prior to 2012, it was always in the top five. Uh, it dropped after the fiasco after the retention election uh, in the same-sex marriage case, but it still ranks number 13. Professor Fitzpatrick State, Tennessee, ranks 30. He will tell you that he successfully uh, persuaded Tennessee to eliminate its judicial nomination system like we have here in Iowa. And he, he was successful. They did change it. And after they changed it, Tennessee went from 19 to 30. Let me tell you some other statistics from that United States Chamber of Commerce survey. In terms of court's treatment of tort and contract litigation, Iowa ranks 15 out of 50, Tennessee 20. Court's treatment of damages, Iowa ranks 9 out of 50, Tennessee is 23. This is one I like, judges impartiality. Trial judges impartiality, Iowa ranks number 9, Tennessee 30. Trial judges competency, Iowa ranks 21, Tennessee 36. If if changing our judicial nomination system to what they did in Tennessee is the answer, I submit to you that there's no reason to race to the bottom. Uh, quality of appellate review, this is a real interesting one for me too. The, this is what the Chamber of Commerce says. Iowa ranks number 11, Tennessee 36. I am the bar president. As the bar president, I get to go all over the state and all over the country really and meet with other bar presidents and other bar leaders. I can tell you without a doubt, without any hesitation, they all say to me, boy, I wish we had a judicial nomination system like you have in Iowa. Now, why should lawyers elect lawyers to the commissions? Good question. It is a good question. Well, let me give you one good answer right off the bat. It's because Charles Grassley and Dave Stanley and uh, Bill Stewart and the Republican leaders back in the 1950s thought that was the way it should be done. And they'd done an extensive study of it at the time, and that's the way they passed it. You know, the legislation to adopt merit selection wasn't something that was proposed by Democrats. It was proposed by Republicans. Nothing's changed since 1959, 1961, or 1962 when the amendment was passed by the voters of Iowa. Uh, Lawyers do a better job of vetting these candidates. We do have special training. We do have special knowledge. We know about, we know about the job of being a judge. Uh, we appear in front of them all the time. Uh, we know what, it's, uh, what, what makes a good judge, what makes, what makes the, uh, a, a fair and impartial judge. Uh, political leaders in Des Moines, uh, having them pick members of the commissions, especially the lawyer members of the commission. I mean, I, Senator Peterson, the minority leader of the Senate, uh, I haven't asked her this question, but I suspect she doesn't know the names of the lawyers in all the 14 district districts where there's nominating commissions to a point. She'd have to ask somebody. She wouldn't know. Why not let the local people in the local communities pick those nominating commissioners? You know, if we're all interested in uh, local control of, of things and getting it out of the federal government or getting it out of the state government and having local control, uh, letting the political leaders in Des Moines make all the selections on the nominating commissions makes no sense. That's, the, that's at least that's the position that we take. Uh, you know, tides will, t will turn. Uh, in the 50s, before merit selection, we elected judges and the Democrats controlled the elections. Uh, that was one of the reasons why Harvey Uhlenhoff and Bill Stewart and Dave Stanley and people like that decided they wanted to try something different because they were the judges were all Democrats. Uh, I, uh, uh, I will uh, tell you that uh, I wrote an article about this a couple of months ago, and I got a telephone call one night, and it, it, and it was from this guy. And I thought it was a prank call, to be honest with you, <laughs> but but it was uh, from Neil Smith. I think he's 98 years old, 99, something like that. Congressman Neil Smith, he was in the legislature in the late 1950s. And he calls me on the phone, he says, Tom, I read your article, I just want you to know about what life was like back in the late 1950s. Uh, the Republicans came to me and to 
Lex Hawkins and the other Democratic leaders at the time and said, we know you're winning all the elections, the judicial elections, but we would like to change this to adopt a merit selection system, uh, which is the one we have today. And Neil said, you know, we thought about it, we talked about it, and we were like, well, should we do it or not? And we, after, after about six hours worth of conversation with their caucus, they said, you know, the tide's likely to change someday. Someday, that might not be the case. The Democrats might not be winning all the elections. So they went along and they told Harvey Uhlenhoff and the folks that were proponents of this legislation, absolutely, we'll go along with you. So the support for this system that we have in place today was bipartisan. And then, of course, it was passed by the Iowa legis by the Iowa voters. <laughs> activist judges. Um, I know that's a big topic. You know that we have activist judges, and that's why I want to tell you about Bill Stewart, Judge Stewart, because I remember this. Well, I was just in high school, but but uh, Bill Stewart was the first beneficiary. He was the first person that was appointed uh, to the Supreme Court based on merit. Uh, and one of the cases that he got, many of you will understand, it's called. Uh, Cat, Catco versus Briney. Does anybody remember that case? Uh, you know, it's a very famous case. And it was a case of, it was a trap gun case. You know, this uh, Briney fella uh, had been tired of people breaking into his house. And so he set a trap gun out in his yard. And so that when the burglars came to break into the house, they would trip over this wire and the gun would go off and it would stop them. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, Briney was, was going to rob this guy's house, I think, and he tripped over the wire and he got shot. And he was seriously injured and the case went to court. And the Supreme Court gets the case and they conclude that, uh, that the trap gun was not appropriate, it wasn't right, and that, that uh, Mr. Uh, Catco was entitled to monetary damages. And Bill Stewart was the author of that opinion. And in Little Sheraton, Iowa, where I was from, uh, out on the golf course, he caught more hell than anybody. You are a nut activist judge. You know what? What were you thinking when you issued that decision? Uh, and it was in the newspapers as being an activist thing. Well, you know, as we look back on it today, I don't think anybody would have would have disagreed. Would, I don't think anybody would disagree with him today. But I can tell you, my dad was shocked about it. My dad thought he was 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 wrong. But you know, that's what judges have to do. They have to make tough decisions. Um, this thing about change in merit selection, you know, uh, uh, I didn't see any candidates campaigning on this last year. Uh, the people ha really haven't had an opportunity to, to weigh in on this. Um, you know, and I, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, this is a very significant change to the way we select our judges, the people that, that occupy the third branch, the third co-equal branch of government, and to, to, to not involve the people is just wrong. Um, one of the concerns that we have is that if the governor and the legislative leaders pick all the commission members, including the lawyers, the party in power could stack the commissions with unqualified lawyers who don't have a clue what makes a good judge, or they could stack the commissions with lawyers pursuing a specific political agenda. It's just not right. Bringing politics back into the system is not right. Uh, there's a reason Charles Grassley and Dave Stanley and Bill Stewart and other Republican leaders back then did it the way they did, and there's no reason to change today. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tom. And I'm just going to take a few minutes to respond to a few things that Tom said. And I just want to make clear at the outset that I want Tom to stay involved with judicial selection in Iowa, even if we take away the spots on the commission that are reserved for lawyer selection. I, I want him to continue reading those, those tall files that he, he reads on each person that wants to be a judge. I want him to keep interviewing people and I want him to give his opinion about these people to his fellow citizens. I just don't want to give him veto power over one-third of the Iowa government. So thoughtful, public service minded people like Tom make this country much better, but I don't think that Tom and his lawyer colleagues need to have more say than the other citizens of Iowa on who the judges are. Judges' decisions affect everybody, 
not just lawyers, and everyone should have the same say. Tom says that when he and his colleagues on the commissions um, talk about the candidates, talk to the candidates, they never ask or talk about political things. They never ask, are you going to overturn this decision on abortion, or what is your view about this or that? I believe him 100 percent. If you ask federal judges, did the President of the United States ask you, were you going to overturn Roe v. Wade, what your views were about gay marriage? They all tell you no, and I believe them 100 percent as well. When you ask federal judges, did the White House Counsel's Office ask you, were you going to overturn Roe v. Wade? What do you think about affirmative action? They all say no. I believe them 100 percent. You don't have to ask a candidate what their views are to know something about what their views are. As Tom says, he knows the other lawyers in this county. He probably has an idea of what their views are without asking them. Uh, Tom had some questions about where I got my data from. It is true that in a lot of the merit states, once you get on the bench, you're prohibited from giving any more campaign contributions. But when we did our study, we looked at the campaign contributions that judges had made throughout their lives, meaning before they became judges. And you don't have to take my word for it. Those same two political scientists from Stanford and Harvard, not Federalist Society people, uh, they have replicated my conclusions when they did their big data merge between Martindale Hubble and the campaign contribution databases. They filtered out just the judges in each state and they showed the exact same thing I did, that states like Iowa that use lawyer-dominated commissions have judges to the left of the publics in their state. So it's not just me, it's also Harvard and Stanford. If Vanderbilt's not good enough for you, maybe those schools are. I think I have the same data that Tom has on the uh, commissioners. And it, it's, I have the data for the current commissioners, how many are D's and how many are R's, and I have also data from 2011 in January, how many D's and how many R's there were on the commissions then. And what these data show is that when you have Republican governors, they appoint a lot of Republican commissioners. And when you have Democrat governors, they appoint a lot of Democrat commissioners. And regardless of whether you have Republican governors or Democrat governors, the lawyer-selected commissioners are Democrats. So the question again is why? Why should, no matter who the people are picking, the lawyers get special spots that tend to always be dominated by Democrats? Uh, Maybe it's because they know more than the rest of us do, but I, again, think that even if they do more, know more than the rest of us do, that's an argument for keeping them involved in the process. It's not an argument for giving them veto power. Tom says nothing has changed since you adopted your method many decades ago. Things have changed. Uh, we now understand that uh, lawyers uh, are uh, just as political as everyone else and that their politics are different from everyone else's. Uh, many of the states that have or had merit systems have reconsidered them in recent years. Tom mentioned my state of Tennessee. We did get rid of our merit commission in Tennessee. When I uh, moved to Tennessee 12 years ago, our merit commission reserved 12 of the 17 spots for uh, lawyer picks. Uh, we don't have a merit commission anymore unless the governor chooses to create one at the governor's own discretion and the governor can put whoever he wants to on the commission. Uh, the state of Kansas uh, got rid of their commission for some of their appellate judges and they want to do it uh, for others. Uh, the state of uh, Oklahoma is in the process of reconsidering their uh, commission system as well. And even the state that started it all, Missouri, is thinking about and has there's been many bills proposed in recent years to eliminate their system as well. Uh, so I think the trend is not in favor of more lawyer dominated commission states. The trend is away from this particular model. It did have its heyday. There are a lot of states that uh, continue to use it today but I think those states are increasingly reconsidering it. The entire theory behind merit selection 
was uh, hatched in the progressive era. Uh, it was a time when um, the progressives thought we needed to move government away uh, from politics and towards experts. And they said, well, who are the experts when it comes to judges? It's the lawyers. So let's let the lawyers pick all of our judges. I think we understand now that uh, lawyers have political views like everyone else and that judges affect uh, everyone else. And so, again, I'm just not sure that we want to reserve special veto rights for one trade group uh, that we do not extend to everyone else. Uh, but thank you very much. The lawyer elected members don't have veto rights. I don't have veto rights. Uh, I can tell you that the lawyer elected members of the Polk County Judicial Nomination Commission don't have veto rights. Uh, and if you look at the commissions as a whole, if you look at the state commission, you look at the other nominating commissions around the state, it, it is the appointed members that have the control. He's right. You know, the problem with the system that where it becomes political is because of the appointed members. It's when, I mean, for instance, uh, Governor Branstad and Governor Reynolds, uh, virtually all of the commissioners that they've appointed are Republicans. They're supporters. I mean, that's not surprising. And when Vilsack was governor and when, when uh, Culver was governor, that's what they did. They appointed Democrats. Uh, those are the ones that skew the system. The lawyer elected members, let's, let me give you an idea. If you look at the lawyer elected members around the state, 51% of them are Democrats. The rest of them are Republicans and others, right? I mean, so it's not like they're running the show. They can't do it. It's the appointed members that cause the most problems. If there was a change to be made, it might be in that regard, but it wouldn't be on the lawyer elected side. Uh, you know, he talked about Kansas and Oklahoma and Missouri. Those are all states that, that rate significantly below Iowa on the Chamber of Commerce uh, surveys. Uh, at least uh, in the Chamber of Commerce surveys, of course, is for business. Business. What does business think about the judicial system in each state? Is it good? Is it bad? Do we want to practice? Do we want to open our shop there? Do we want to do business there? And these, by the way, the Chamber of Commerce survey deals with businesses that have uh, revenue of in excess of a hundred million dollars a year, in excess of hundred million dollars a year. That those surveys show Iowa is well liked by big business. Iowa's courts are well liked by big business. We ought not, if if the if it ain't broke, we ought not fix it. This to me looks like a solution, looking for a problem. You know. Uh, we, uh, at least as the Bar Association is concerned, uh, can't for the life of us figure out why we would want to chase other states that are not doing as well with business and our judicial system, why we'd want to do that. So we're here to tell you that we think that, that the legislation should, be, uh, should not be passed. Thanks. Questions? Thank you. A question for Mr. Levis. Um, there are a lot of registered lobbyists at the Capitol. Uh, there are a couple of registered lobbyists who represent the Iowa State Bar Association. Um, a lot of the lobbyists who are there represent associations, trade groups, who uh, they're, they're there to represent the interests of their members. Are the uh, lobbyists for the Iowa State Bar Association representing the interests of the Bar Association and its members, or are they representing the public interest? You know, the, the lobbyists for the Bar Association are representing the interests of the Bar Association. That is for sure. But we believe that it's also representative of the interests of the citizens of the state of Iowa. I had a question about the uh, chairman of each of these commissions uh, who's a judge. Is there an inherent conflict of interest there that uh, needs to be handled with, with lawyers? Um, having to um, appear before these judges in, in matters and also being a part of a, of a commission that the judge is uh, chairman of? Good question. I don't think so. I mean, that's not been my experience, and I've been involved in 10 selections, so I don't. But, uh, uh, I mean, Judge Gamble was our 
it was he was our senior judge, and uh, I mean Ryan was on the commission for a short period of time, and some of the others were too. But uh, you know, the chief judge Gamble basically sat there and uh, let us do our thing. I mean, he didn't run the show, uh, so I, I don't think so. I've never heard anybody do that. I've heard people say that Justice Wiggins runs the show at the State Judicial Nomination Commission. I've heard that in some of the arguments up at the Capitol. Uh, and again, if, if Justice Wiggins has been running the show on the State on the state Judicial Nomination Commission, he hasn't done a very good job the last three times because the, the candidates and the, the, the justices are all pretty conservative Republicans. I think there is some concern with having one of the justices on the commission. You know, they have a lot of influence over the lawyers and even the non-lawyers because of their position. It's, um, it's, you know, they're more than first among equals when they get into a room with these other folks. And so I have some concerns about that. And it's also odd to me that they might have a role in picking who their colleagues are. Um, and so that, again, is a bit of a, uh, I don't know if I would say conflict of interest, but it's a lot of power uh, <coughs> to uh, influence uh, the direction of your own court. And so it's something that has troubled me. Now, you know, the very first state that adopted one of these plans, Missouri, did it that way. And so a lot of the states that copied Missouri have emulated it. So it's not uh, unheard of around the country to have commissions with one of the justices um, on it. But uh, there are plenty of other states that do not do that. And I think it just, even if there hasn't been any problems, there's potential for, for problems with the influence and also the self-interest in selecting your colleagues. May I just respond to one more thing about that? I'll just tell you that when you read the materials from back in the 50s, when they set this up, uh, J Judge Uhlenhoff and some of the others looked at it, whether or not to have a senior judge on the commissions, and they thought that a senior judge brings something to the table. They certainly know about the nature of the job. They certainly know what it's going to take to be a judge. And they certainly want somebody that's going to be collaborative with them, somebody that's going to be not, not going to be a troublemaker in, their, uh, in, the, in the group of judges in that, in that particular district or county. Uh, so the people that started this legislation back in the 50s all thought that it was very important. And I again say to you, what's changed? What's changed? Thank you. Um, thank you both for being here tonight. So one, one of the elements of the legislation we have before us in the Iowa House is that it removes the requirement that the eight, well, the, the one half of the commissioners that are selected by the governor be, at least on the state nominating commission, be confirmed by the Senate. And, and that to me seems like one of the biggest changes in that it allows one person complete discretion about one half of the commissioner sitting on that, on that commission. So I guess I'd, I'd be interested in both of your opinions on whether or not, and I guess Professor Fitzgerald, whether or not in your state how you feel about just removing any requirement for confirmation and then also from Mr. Levin. Thank you. So um, I don't have strong views on whether the governor should get the governor's spots, the legislator should get the legislator's spots, or they should have to work together for some or all the spots. I, I, I think that reasonable people can probably disagree on what the best um, process is for the public officials that are putting their spots together. Um, I do think it is important, though, for there to be some place in your system for a check on the governor. Uh, I, I think it would be a bad idea to let the governor pick people for the courts, forget the commission, but for the courts, without another branch of government having some check on that because when the governors are good you know no one cares but when the governors are bad they can put cronies and all kinds of people on, on the bench and so some check from the other branch of the government is important 
and whether that check comes from checking the governor's um, commissioners or whether that check comes from the legislature having enough of its own commissioners that the governor's commissioners can't overwhelm them. Uh, I think you do, you do need to keep both of those political branches involved just to stop cronyism. And that was what the founding generation thought about the federal system. They debated at length whether to have the Senate confirm the president's nominees. And they decided yes, because otherwise the president could put cronies on there. And so I, I think some check is needed. It, cronyism is something that <laughs> bars us anxious about too. Uh, you know, you could get a bad governor uh, that, that would appoint bad people to the commissions and under the proposed legislation right now the governor would pick half of the commissioners, half of the, the ones would be lawyers but the other, but they would be picking, the governor would be pack, picking half of them and then the legislative leaders would be appointing the others. Uh, you know, it's easy to stack the deck for a particular uh, uh, position the, the governor or the who's ever in control at that time to, uh, to, to try to do. Uh, that's what we're so afraid of is, is that whether it's the Republicans doing it or the Democrats doing it, we don't want either party doing that. That's where the lawyers are looking at it. We don't want anybody stacking the deck so that we get bad judges that have a political agenda out there. Uh, we just want impartial judges, judges that are going to be like baseball umpires call them like they see it and not with regard to whether they like that team or not team it's they call it like they see them and that's what we're mostly interested in we fear that this legislation is going to cause havoc with that whether the republicans are in control or the democrats you know if you think about it the way the, the legislation is proposed right now at the end of the day uh, democrats or republicans will have control of 75 percent of the commissioners 75% of all the commissioners. Uh, that's a lot. But I, but I will also tell you right now, the Republicans have control of 67%. And so that's why the other thing, I can't quite figure out why they would want to nuke our old system. Because you know there's always risk that when the Dems come in, they start taking over control and they have 75% of the picks. It, it, they're not going to be wanting to change this back. You know, they're going to be in control then. So we look at it, the Bar Association looks at it and says, wait a minute, this is politicizing our system. This, this has got danger, jeopardy in it for, for, for the way our judicial system works. Uh, and so that's why we are saying, leave the system alone. It ain't broke. Thank you. A two-part question for Professor Fitzgerald. Um, what methos, method, uh, do, methodology did you use to uh, determine uh, that the courts are, as you put it, to the left of the Iowa public. And do you think that the uh, requirement for a retention vote is a safety valve, if that indeed is the case? So those are great questions. So the, the method in the study was this. In each state, I looked at the percentage of votes the public gave to Democratic or Republican candidates for the state legislature over the 20-year time period. and uh, the percentage of votes they gave to D's and R's in the U.S. House races over that 20-year period in each state. That was the baseline for each state. And then I looked at the appellate judges in each state, what percentage of them had given more money to Democrats, what percentage of them had given more money to Republicans, and compared the two. And so I did that for every state, and that created a, um, a, dis uh, uh, a metric on how different or similar the judges to the word of the public in each state. A similar method was used by Bonica and Sin when they replicated my results in their, in their study. They didn't use the public as their baseline. They used the public officials as their baseline to compare to, to the judges. Uh, but the results were, were very similar. The retention election, I think, has some good things about it and some bad things about it. So on the good side, it's, I know you have some famous counterexamples here, but Everywhere else, it's really hard to lose a retention election. 99.5% of the time, judges are retained because there's no opponent, so the public doesn't have anyone to vote for. They're not sure who might replace the judge if they vote them off because there's no opponent. And so judges win 
overwhelmingly. So the good thing about that is that gives judges a fair amount of independence. And I, I, you know, I think judicial independence is important. And uh, how you retain your judges drives how much independence they have. So I think it gives them a lot of independence because it's hard to lose them. On the other hand, um, I think that it puts the judges in a bad position because they don't know if someone is going to start a campaign to get them off until perhaps the last minute. When you have an opponent, they have to declare by a certain date. And so you know whether you need to raise money and go out and campaign. With the retention elections, an interest group could come in in the last three weeks, we've seen that in some states, and dump a bunch of money. And you are flat-footed and don't have time to raise the money to respond. And so I think it puts the judges in a really difficult spot when things like that happen. And so I, I think it's um, probably not an ideal form of accountability for those reasons. I, I mean, you guys have a constitution you've got to live within. So unless you're going to change the constitution, I think you're stuck with your retention elections. But I really like a, a method like the federal system where the executive nominates, the legislature confirms, and then maybe not life tenure, but maybe after 10 years or a long period of time, the judge has to go back and get renominated and, and reconfirmed. That, I think, I would get campaign contributions out of it. It wouldn't have this flat-footed problem, uh, but would still provide some measure of accountability on the back end. One more question. For the professor, I was just wondering, the premise for your studies, I thought I heard you say earlier, the legal profession uh, in and of itself is a bit left of center. Yes. Uh, so I guess, how do you, what I gather is it's a failing that judges who have to be lawyers prior to being judges, but it's a failing that they are also left of center. I wouldn't say it's a failing. Well, I guess you're drawing from a population that's already left. Yes. Um, I guess I'm, I'm looking for you to explain a little bit more on okay. why this is a detachment from, uh, or why this represents a detachment from the general population. So uh, this, this, I think, is a very good question. So um, the lawyer population is left-leaning compared to the general public. Frankly, if you do not account for that when you're picking your judges, you're just going to replicate the lawyer population in your judges. The judges will be left-leaning if you just randomly were to pick um, judges from your lawyer population. They would be just as left-leaning as the lawyers. So uh, the methods that provide for no screening of the lawyer population in terms of their viewpoints um, end up with judiciaries to the left of the public. And so it's not just the merit system that produces the leftward skew, but my study and the Bonica and Sin study show that nonpartisan elections do too. Because if the voters have no idea what your um, viewpoints are, because you take party affiliation off the ballot, you just end up recreating the lawyer population in your judges. So the methods that screen are the ones where you get the judges with viewpoints closer to the public, because you're picking of the lawyer population, you can be more discriminating about which ones you're picking. So political appointment, like the federal system, and partisan elections are the ones where the judge's views and values are most reflective of the public's views and values, because there is some screening of the left-leaning lawyer pool. If there's no screening, you're just going to recreate it. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. OK, hope so. Sorry. Well, let me just say this. If lawyers on these commissions are the problem, if they're the problem and they're causing this left skewing, why does the governor keep appointing lawyers to the commission as appointed members? I mean, Ryan, Ryan was one of them. Uh, the governor appoints lawyer commissioners all the time. If they're the problem, why does the governors do that? It's because they know that the lawyer commissioners know what they're doing. They have a special talent. They have a special knowledge about this. If I could just say one thing about that, the, the problem is not there's lawyers. The problem is who picks the lawyers. If a left-leaning group picks 
the lawyers, then those lawyers are going to be different than, say, the governor lawyers, you know, the lawyers the governor would pick. So there's plenty of conservative <coughs> lawyers. There's a lot more liberal lawyers. So if you let the, the liberal lawyer population as a whole pick the lawyers, they're going to pick different <laughs> lawyers than the governor might pick, depending on what political party the governor's from. So the problem is not the lawyers, it's who picks the lawyers. I think the spot should be open uh, to be picked by the a broader group of people, not just one little group that we know predictably is left-leaning. And I think the data shows, year in and year out, the spots that the lawyers elect are ma ma majority Democrat. And I think your own data supports that, Tom. Well. Uh, you know, all, all I can say to you is that the commissions are controlled by the Republicans, not by the Democrats and not by the lawyers, not by the left-leaning lawyers, if that's the case. That's not the data that exists in the state of Iowa right now. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Please join me in thanking Tom and Brian. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate it. Thank you.